Justin. I am glad I have met you. <laughs> I, I know it sounds weird and patronizing, but I honestly mean that I I'm quite happy. We have met. <clears throat> And I've, I've seen the arguments. And this year, I can see too, I like that so you said again yesterday, like, oh, this class gives me anxiety. But I hope it gives me anxiety in the best way possible, not like. I can make the choice as a teacher, I mean, like, I don't really care what you guys think, and I'm just going to bulldoze through. But I'm glad that you guys have thrown your ideas out there for me to hear and. And I, I just, anyway, that's been intentional, if that makes sense. Like, I did, uh, I wanted you to hear that. And I am glad that you've enjoyed hearing other people argue about stuff. Yes. <laughs> I'm glad you've enjoyed that. I made another one. No, I can sip of it. Can I? Let me get a hit. Let me get a hit of that. Oh my god. Are you guys talking about drugs? No, no, of uh, Austin's stash that he's got back there. I think that's what people are talking about. Yeah. Sometimes those things are good, though. Sometimes they're real trust. Help you. That's all the day. That tastes disgusting. Oh. <laughs> and she goes back from the. She's like, I'm gonna finish it. I'm gonna finish it. That would be a very strange Mountain Dew color to actually like sell people. Like it's because yeah. it's like a purple, but it's like not color. Is it It's like it's putrid punch. I, I don't know what they would sell. I just drink this. Woo! All right, let me make sure I get this stuff here right for you. Here. No. That is very gross. <laughs> <laughs> so who's the, who has the nickel? Alright guys, let's get out of our lovely... I'm so ready to take off the Easter gremlin. No. What is that? Mr. Burning? Yeah. Is the French Revolution? Lucas turns to me and he's like... Okay, you, you mean they're a mob? They're a mob? It's more of a mob occupancy during the French Revolution. But the government, they don't have the government during the French Revolution. Correct, correct. It was more of a mob occupancy. Because only the pockets would have, meaning those pockets would vote, like, because just for right now. Debate with someone about, like, the core politics. At the same time? And he didn't necessarily agree. Oh, but you're talking about like a pocket of just that time. Yeah, I'm saying like, because you're saying, you know, the people, the people, the people why don't you just shoot the majority vote? See, that's why you've got to have cool shoes. Exactly. I was like, I don't think there's going to be one in the I just need to prevent the dream. Like a mob occupancy, and I said, you want to look at an example like that, because we're not in your direct democracy, right? We're in the Republican side. Really? Like the Sassley? Yeah, you can make that clean. Lovely um, singing. Well, yeah, yeah, you can make it clean. So, so let's get out notes, guys, on this last section. To answer your question about 
why it is that we are... I know some people just don't want to Well, ultimately, the country has had those contesting vibes, as we mentioned before, between uh, highly urbanized and populated cities and more suburban or rural areas, even back in the colonial period. Hence, you had the... the you know, Sherman plan, or, or rather you had the, the New, Jer New Jersey plan, excuse me, and the Virginia plan, because there was that tension between the two of both, like, representation with numbers and those that wanted to have regional differences. And the country prided itself, still does, because we were a confederacy that had different independent states. So we have a heritage of that, and that's where the Electoral College's, like, history is, is that we want to emphasize regional interests more than say, yeah, what would happen to France or what would happen. Now, like, I remember, like, I forgot which Republican it was, but they said that, we, that they all knew that Trump should contest, right? He shouldn't concede. And that's because yeah. if Trump does lose, he said there may never be no um, Well, I will say this very quickly, and then we'll get to Keynesian economics. Um, there is a fear within Republicans, uh, I, I'd say in general, that is it a valid The Trump, eh, I won't address that until Friday. Um, there is a concern within Republicans that the Trump mania that has happened in the last four years has been a Band-Aid uh, on a much more uh, egregious problem within the Republican Party, and that is Republicanism currently stands on conservative values that do involve moral laws, as we talked about. You can see that as atheism grows, it doesn't mean atheism is good or bad, but as it grows within the country, that appeal isn't there. Trump was able to get a lot of support by mainly independents and even atheists who didn't really care about conservative values, but they cared about limited government and Trump's yeah, just like charismatic appeal. Yeah. So his, his, some have said, hijacking the Republican Party might have gotten some short-term success. The long term, the Republicans might have to you know, take the band aid off and realize, oop, we have to actually set the broken bone. That is, how can we long term have the Republican Party be appealing nationwide? Imagine, now I'll leave with this analogy. Uh oh. If it, no, <laughs> no, I don't think it's an uh oh. I think it's safe in this. And that if we were to have a classroom, let's say this classroom, Olivia, were full of. Um, marketing and branding executives, right? You're talking about mad men type people who can like spin anything. Esther, you guys can spin anything. You guys can create brands and images and PR in an amazing way. You guys have awesome viral marketing campaigns. You guys get what I'm saying, right? If I were to take this class full of them and, and take uh, one of Rigby's government classes and say that they're full of engineers actually creating a substantial product, but they can't brand anything. They don't know how to sell the product. And if I were to say, okay, these two classes are going against one another, who would win? Your class. Our class. Our class. Your class doesn't mean the substance of what they're selling is actually better, no. but it means you can sell it better, right? I think that's what the problem stars. currently Stockers. is the Democratic Party versus Republican Party. There have been claims that the Democratic Party are much better at branding of their messages right now in terms of a growing generation. Does that make sense? Because oftentimes the Republican Party can be seen as the party of no, no, no. Didn't we watch the debate, Esther, yeah. going back to your comments? It was like emotionally it didn't seem as appealing as Democrat. That's where the Republicans have a problem, and Trump has sort of given a, a Band-Aid over it potentially. So that's my, my answer to you of, uh, you know, why the Electoral College is there, and will Republicans long-term have a problem because if he were not to contest the election, would they have a problem? Yes, they have to really address it. And I was gonna say this for Sammy, but she's not here. Um, what could be very cool is in 2024, maybe the rebranding of the Republican Party is to shift more closer to Mike Pence, even though that's very traditional Republican. I don't know if that would have national appeal. Get the Utah vote for You know, oh my gosh, Utah would all like, fall over fainting. But you could see Trump will run. run. Again. Like, yeah, like you could see. Do you see think Trump will run again? Uh, because of his age, no. And this is the, the tricky part. Hey, will even Biden run a second term? So that's what I'm saying is you could very well see an unprecedented no, thing in that Harris, you have yeah. a battle of VPs where you have Kamala that is Harris. That's so cool, Pence versus. Which it could Pence. be interesting, but I'm telling you though. And then Trump Harris chooses, chooses Michelle Obama as her VP. <laughs> yeah. Oh. But, Snap. But also tying back to, to the, to we the, have West the presidential though. section, did we cover that? And some of you are balking at me like, but wait, white male Protestant, we don't really care about that. 
We don't, but other people do. Marketers the numbers do. show otherwise, right? So, so what I'm telling you, Gabe, is in 2024, you could see like a Pence Harris, you know, against one another, which could be pretty interesting. Um, so that's my same answer for Biden. And I will be, sh ladies and gentlemen, if Biden were to run again in 2024, I will be shocked yeah, because it will be very much similar to a, an almost communist era propped up individual. He will be, his age. He will his age. He will his age. He'll be 82. He's on medicine. I mean, just wrapping your head around that, like, and that's four years. The bigger so of four years, and as you guys have seen the memes of like how Obama and George W. Bush and even Trump have aged, like the presidency ages you immensely. Can you imagine? But I do believe it's a way for an African American woman to get the nominee or the nomination of a major party. I think 2024. I think Harris. If I were to run, it would very well quickly turn into a shell of an individual at the beginning of his term. And that could be very optically scary for a country because it's like, oh no, that feels like a Russian communist wheel him out in a wheelchair, let's see how this goes. And that's that's Especially because thing. like you travel all the time. Like yeah, even I mean, like when I travel, like meaning, I get tired. I mean like, even if Trump alone, had won this election because he was the oldest president, Esther, by the time that he would finish this term. I mean, the, the tw till 2024. Oh, man. The, the age and the wear and tear. During the end of Reagan's second term, who was previously the oldest president, I told you this before, photographers were not allowed to actually take pictures of him below his jawline because he had the turkey neck going so bad. They wouldn't let him do that. Likewise, he had a normal average waking time of about 10.30 a.m. to 11 a.m. in the latter half of his second term. Does that make sense? Because of his age. And and he was five years younger than what we'll be seeing here. Yeah, so, can you imagine if the president isn't waking up till 10, 30, 11 o'clock every morning now? Uh, uh, right. I mean, I mean that's like what's his name? Roosevelt went up to Yellowstone for like a month. Right. Right. Just yes. So he like. You can always put his head in a. So. Does that help Gabe in terms of electoral, right? Uh, that, I hope that helps in terms of the Republican identity is going to be a question, right? Um, uh, and no, I don't predict uh, 2024 they would. If they were, it would be the biggest bait and switch you'd see. Yeah. But you very well, Sammy, I'm thinking that 2024 could be interesting because you could see, could see a battle of the VPs and that Pence could be the Republican nominee hoping to get on the coattails of Trump's success in Midwest states, right? Who else would be? And, and in a way, and then Harris could do that. So you could see a ticket that way. Um, Who else would be, be a Republican nominee option? Ted, would Ted Cruz run uh, again? He, he might, but he's on paper not, not popular. Uh, Mark Rubio, He's run on paper, not popular. Really? Isn't he? Couldn't they do the same thing with the Democrats? First Hispanic president? It depends on what the Republicans want to do. And I'll get to that on Friday in terms of my take on the different parties and so forth. It depends on their, on what they want to do. Right? I know that's like if they want to do a retread of what they've done and hope the numbers go a little bit more their that's, way. Like, that's how Trump won Florida. Was There's like a lot of Hispanic and Latinos like... Now you're on to something, Gabe. Um, but... Before we do anything more, Kennedy, yes. Okay, this was like back to their age, and it like doesn't have a lot to do. We were talking about it when we were watching like Biden's speech last week. And what you guys saw, if you saw that he issued the word mandate, he issued that when he gave sort of his, and that is completely, you all know, that's like red flags. Like, I was like, bro. Yeah, that I is the, and he hinted at like lockdowns too. Like, like, but I'm thinking in terms of what we do know is that him saying that him getting elected is going to be a mandate for him to come out and heal the country. Like, anytime you're invoking that name, like, that's, no, 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 you have the anti-mandate, buddy. If anything, somebody who wins, and Trump unfortunately didn't do this, but if you win by that close of a margin, that candidate should be taking stock and being like, okay, I have to be more moderate than maybe what I normally would have done, because it was that narrow of a margin. But he was issuing that word a lot, and I'm like, what I heard it once. But maybe another time. I heard it once. What if he goes gun crazy, so, though? Kennedy, keep going. Okay. Because um, we were talking about his age, and, like, he is old. 77 or yeah. 78. Like, yeah. That's old. That's an old guy. It is. Yeah. Yeah, and yeah. I was, like, thinking, and then I was, like, the president of the church, you know, that mm -hmm. most of us mm -hmm. belong to is, like, 96. So I was, like, and he's still going strong. So I just thought it was funny. Because he is a living Yeah, I did. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, well, I just well, thought it was funny. I just thought it was funny, you know, because yeah. he's, like, almost 100, and everybody's like, yeah, you go. And then right. Biden's like, I, 
I love that irony. But we're also kind of commanded to follow him. That's a very good uh, irony. We're also um, like commanded to follow him. I don't think the president him, so like, the church has been used to their butts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Just sort of a funny yeah. irony. Yeah, like it's a funny irony observation. Oh, I thought you were saying it was funny no. that we followed him. I was no, like, no, like, like Kennedy. That's the like, irony. Like, yeah. like, <laughs> what are you? What are you arguing? Oh yeah. Yeah. Like, I get it. I get it. I get the irony of it. Oh, um, yeah, no, that's, that's, a, that's a good observation. That's almost 20 years. And I think what Tyler was going back to with the presidency, not, we're not commenting, we agree. It's sort of an interesting, huh, that is ironic. Yeah. What Tyler was saying about, like, TR, like, when they left and stuff like that, current day in terms of 24-hour news networks and how much it grinds presidents to a pulp, right, that, that analogy, that idea, um, thankfully, most leaders of most churches in the world don't have that much scrutiny in terms of like aging them that way. Does that make sense? Yeah. Um, so that's a good thing where we can feel like, all right, attaboy. I think for the presidency, it's like, okay, uh oh. <laughs> yeah. going to be, yeah. No, I, it's a very good observation, though. Okay, Keynesian economics. Hope that answers uh, Tyler and Gabe's questions there, too. Uh, two things we're going to write down here for Keynesian economics. And think of the term like cane, like you literally are walking with a cane. Candy I know it looks cane. like Keynesian. Cane. It's more Keynesian economics. Okay. Like what's how? Right. Why are you going to use the cane? Yeah. Yeah. So, so the proper British pronunciation can do this is, is, is not Keynes, but Keynes. Keynesian. Um, as I had to learn after getting corrected. So Keynesian economics is what we're talking about. We know the difficulties, but the successes of supply side economics, right? We got that. Um, and you guys made some good comments at the end of yesterday's class, Sarah, of like you have to, any good economist knows that you have to pick and choose at the right time. Like you have to do that. Okay. So the other side of this is Keynesian economics. The first thing you're going to write down is in the Great Depression, an economist named Keynes, John Meter Keynes. So an economist named Keynes, K E Y. NES. So in the Great Depression, an economist named Keynes, who was also a friend of, for some points, what president? FDR, FDR, yes, who was also a friend of FDR. So in the Great Depression, an economist named Keynes. How do you spell Keynes? K E Y N E S. Just like it says, yeah. Keynes, who was also a friend of FDR, proposed an economic plan. Propose an economic plan. That either increased taxes on the rich, okay, so in the Great Depression, an economist named Keynes, who was also a friend of FDR, Propose a new economic plan that either increased taxes on the rich, printed new money, or borrowed money. So John Maynard Keynes proposed a new economic plan that either increased taxes on the rich, printed new money, or borrowed money, and we'll stop there for a second, to then do something in a second. We'll get to it. So his plan is a little more nuanced than, say, supply-side economics, hence the term trickle-down economics, right? So Libby, you have this idea of, like, supply-side economics is pretty straightforward, right? You're hoping that producers will have more profit and then can expand business, and that's how you can stimulate the economy. You're trying to get that healthy flow of consumers to product, or uh, products to consumers. Cool. With, with Keynesian economics, it's a little different because, remember, the Great Depression wasn't just the Great Depression for the U.S. It was the Great Depression for the world, really. The stock market crashed here for the U.S. that was pretty specific. But worldwide, the countries in Europe were going through depression. Namely, you had a lot, Ellie, after the end of World War I, countries like Germany and France. The Alsace-Lorraine Alsace region was in turmoil. So all these countries were struggling. And John Maynard Keynes is like, oh, the U.S. is also struggling hard, so we have an idea. We're going to call it prime the pump economics. 
Okay, this is the other term for Keynesian economics. You're going to prime the pump. Uh, I'm not having you guys write down prime the pump. You can if you want to. No, we haven't gotten to the second thing yet. But this plan's interesting. Where FDR is like, crap, we don't know what to do for our country. We're struggling, Spencer, because we have the stock market fall. People, we need to get products to consumers. But anybody left, like the Monopoly Man dude, who has money, is literally sitting on his money and storing it in their mattresses because if you've seen It's a Wonderful Life, you don't trust the banks, right? You don't, you guys get that it's analogy? Nice well, and it's also that entire yes. generation. Yeah, I love that. An, an entire generation, but, but you guys can see the context of that movie, right? Yeah. Is built on, the banks are gonna fall, they, they poorly invest, everything falls out from under you, which we know in capitalism happens, but this fell hard. You're talking about a perfect storm of, of everything horrible going on. The U.S. suffered from this. Consumers aren't getting money to therefore buy products, so there's a big blockage there, right? Producers are sitting on their money not making products because they don't think people will buy it, and consumers don't have jobs to then buy products. So there's, there's our blockage. At this time, Herbert Hoover, if you guys remember good old Annie, does that sound right? He was, um, he believed that he didn't do Reaganomics, but he believed that like if you allow producers enough freedom that they'll make jobs, Esther, they didn't, right? So when FDR comes into office, he's like, okay, screw the producers. They're not doing their job. So I'm gonna focus instead on <coughs> consumers. So what this means is, stick with me here, stick with me. This means as they focus on consumers, FDR is not an economist. It's like, how can I help cut out the middleman? And Keynes is like, I got it. We're going to increase taxes on the rich. We're not going to tax the poor, but we're going to increase taxes on the rich. And it's sort of the Robin Hood theory, right? You take from the rich to give to the poor. Or, and if we don't have rich people, instead we're going to print new money. Which you know when I say that, people are like, <gasps> you can't print money. Why not? Why can't you print money? In general, it's inflation that lowers the value, right? The more you have of something, the less it's worthwhile. So this, there's this weird balancing, right? But then he also said, okay, if you don't want to print money or um, uh, tax the rich, you can borrow from other countries. So then do what? You have, you have more capital now, Maisie, right? Like, so you have more money from the rich, maybe? Or you've printed more fake money? Money's all fake, but you've printed more of it, right? Or you've borrowed money from other um, countries. So, so that how does that work? Is there just like a national bank and they're like, oh, we're going to transfer $2.5 billion. I you're going to say that and I want to hold that off because oh. it's going to break your brain. Because economics... It really look, never happens. When you they look, just exchange debt. When you, yeah. When you look closely at that, that's going to get weird. But I will talk about it. Or they send a ship like with crates full of cash. Tyler, yeah. <laughs> Tyler, I will talk about when we get through Keynesian economics. So now, Hunter, they have all this money, this capital. So the question is, is they do any of these things, or a mixture of them, to give what to whom? Yes, to give what to them? Money. Money. So guys, you've written down here in the Great Depression, an economist named Keynes, who is also a friend of FDR, proposed an economic plan that either increased taxes on the rich, printed new money, or borrowed money to give to the poor. And steal from the rich. <laughs> so they would use it to buy stuff from the rich. Yeah, you know, the rich would just spend all their money even more. Mm -hmm. To so to give to the poor, so they would use it to buy stuff. All right. So all these ideas are to, in essence, maybe take from the rich or take from other countries or print new money, so that people, consumers, forget producers, producers can have money. Excuse me, consumers can have money and they can buy stuff and then you stimulate the economy, right? So the guy who's the producer sitting on the money is like, oh, whoa, they're buying all of my whizzle kadoos or whatever weird Dr. Seuss word you want to use. They're buying, you know, what's that? The Lorax, the yeah. <laughs> the the needs, yeah. They're buying it, Sophie, so that means I'm going to hire more employees and we're stimulating the economy, right? Because the producers are too stubborn, we're going to go right to the consumers. This is. Robin Hood economics, this is Keynesian economics. That's what he proposed. Are there bad things with this? Yeah. But at the time, it was pretty revolutionary. And I will just tell you one thing, then I'll get to the comments. I love what John Henry Keynes said, because when he proposed this idea, economists were like, what the crap are you thinking? Inflating money? That's like you are playing with a Russian roulette game, because if you inflate it too much, the money's going to be worthless. You, you want to get indebted to other countries? What the crap are you 
that's like world war again. You're gonna do that? Or wait, you're gonna steal money uh -huh, from the rich to give to the poor? That means there's some problems with that. And he said, look, long term, this is not a good economic plan. But long term, we're all dead anyway, so it doesn't matter. Yeah, what a savage. <laughs> and like people were like, he's not wrong though. Did he actually say he, that? He did. He, oh, he, he oh, said. He said that long term, this economic plan doesn't bear weight. However, long term, we're all dead anyway. Damn. Meaning the depression was so bad, right? I started getting to say the depression was so bad. They're like, okay. We talked about those little, those little like valleys. It's like if it's that bad, and producers are being stubborn, we're not communists. If we're communists, we can force the producers to do whatever. But once we do that, that's a little bridge you can't uncross. So they say, forget the producers, go to the consumers, because they have money. And here's a really harsh thing: poor people make really bad financial decisions, but that's great for the economy. What? This is true. George W. Bush gave what's called a tax cut, a tax rebate in his second term in 2007. And he was very frustrated because people got more money, right, from their tax rebates. And he was frustrated because they put it in the bank for investment. Why is that bad? Wait, they got a tax cut? They put it in the bank? So they got a tax rebate. He put it on top of the tax refund like your parents usually get every year, right, but you'll get soon. Because he wanted them to spend it. He wanted them to go to like Walmart and buy like big screens. Go buy crap. This is be irresponsible. This was 2007. 2007. Was it the financial crisis? Was it Yeah, but smart people don't help our economy. So too big to So, guys, Keynes acknowledges that long term this has some problems, right? But he's like, you got to get out of the slump. That's his idea. We had several people with hands up. Sam. Oh, like if a consumer got more money, right. Now, and that's a hard thing, because consumers can be like wise, and they're like, crap. <laughs> but that's where if you can give, and I think, Tyler, some of you are saying welfare. Hello, this is really where you see the advent of our current day system. The FDR plan shifted us from what you would say, capitalism to more of a neoliberal model. We are, we are in a neoliberal model, meaning that we have basically freedom to buy and do whatever. But are there some safety nets in our country? Yeah. Yes, we're a neoliberal economic model. Yeah, I can go buy one on Walmart. And then, <laughs> yes, but if you lose jobs and don't have funds, will the government give you something? Yes. Probably, might not be everything, not a cradle to grave thing, but something, and with that something, that's a neoliberal model, and that's from Keynesian economics. So Sammy, if they invest it, that sucks, sort of, right? Um, but if you can give welfare checks to those who are poor, like, I, it sounds harsh, but like, you want the healthy flow of products to consumers. So you want people to make sort of frivolous decisions. Or, or, right? Um, that's for a country, countrywide thing. And that's where like, if people, if any of your families are like, in a micro way, your family not having debt is really good. In a macro way, a country not having debt is not very good. Does that make sense in a big picture way? Because you want countries in a way. Like individually, like if the consumers get that like, tax break of welfare, like, right. it's smarter than to invest it individually, but right. the economy is probably not. For the economy, you're like, come on, buy a big screen. Buy something stupid. Get some spinners on the Escalade. Let's go. Let's go. Come on. Like, there, there is a little bit of that. Hey, I like my big screen. Don't make fun of that. Are kidding me right now? No. <laughs> so, uh, we saw some other hands up. So, Sam, does that answer the question there? That's the other problem with Keynes. You can't force a consumer to do it. That, you know, you can encourage them. You can give big rebates on cars, right? But you can't force them. Other hands up. Hunter? So, when you say that the United States is in like $27 trillion in debt, yeah. you know that goes off the national treasury or like the bank, whatever, all the gold and everything like that. Uh -huh. When you say you're in debt, is that just they borrowed money from other people or how, how You're getting to what Tyler is saying. Can you hold off for one more thing we're gonna write down and then I will unveil the horrible like wizard of Oz behind the curtain? Because when you like remove the curtain because that's I wish that were the case. I would love if we I wish that were the case, but the reality is not it's built on a system called fiat, which we'll get to in a second. I wish that were the case because it'd be easier to understand. For other government classes, like every year I tell them like, yep, that's how it is. Not how it is, but the, so where does debt come from, right? Like we'll get to it in a second. Um, to hold off, I hope I answer your question in a second. 
We also had other enemies. Yeah, so I was just wondering, like, who the, the rich and the poor, like, what, like, is it like, how do you, yeah. where's the line? Yeah, so, like, the line is in the sand. The I, like $1, oops, like yeah, yeah. correct, the marginal tax brackets, which is what makes up, like, our 16,000 IRS code, which is crazy long in all the exceptions, <laughs> these marginal tax brackets are what matter to everything, meaning, do you earn less than $100,000 a year, but have a family bigger than a size of five, claiming four dependents? Do you have certain exceptions that one of those children has a disability? Is there Do you have one fraud? of those exceptions in that you have two kids in college who are under the age of 25? Do you now see where the IRS tax code is very complicated? Because they try to account for all of those things, and hence the tax rebates you guys hear so much about is your employer guesstimates what tax bracket you're in, but at the end of the year, because of different exceptions or kids, hello Utah, then that changes where you're at. It's not just what you earn, but the size of your home and everything like that. The cost of so, correct, but, and they try to account for it, yeah. So to answer your question of what are the tax brackets, the major one in terms of the rich, if you are earning two, if you're earning more than $200,000, you can sometimes get taxed almost 67% of your income. Okay? Holy crap. Now, it depends on the size. And I've already started just going off the book. So, <laughs> I don't want to be So in terms of, much. you're wondering for that. Now, there's a lot of exceptions, right? That's yeah. what makes tax code so difficult. 67%? Yes. That's so, and, and the question then is, what a... <laughs> So they're urging people the real, to go the off real the number books. that you're looking for is two hundred fifty thousand. If you're earning two hundred fifty thousand dollars or more, like you, you're going to have a pretty high tax rate because we have from the Sixteenth Amendment what's called the progressive tax. That's the more you earn, the more you're taxed. Okay. So, so two hundred fifty thousand or so is that line. Okay. So, Maisie, does that answer your question of like what's the line? Now, here's the thing: the poverty line is if you have a family and you're like. $40,000 or less, then you can qualify for no Keynesian, taxes. yeah, almost oh. no taxes, almost. You can qualify for Keynesian type economics if you get different um, rebates and so your, how your marginal you tax brackets that? very low. Like, how can you avoid? <laughs> <laughs> you you hire a very good corporate lawyer. Go to the you make you, go, you do everything off the books. There's no, something called the cash payments. under the table. You only. hire a very good corporate lawyer who. Helps you invest in businesses that you don't have to claim as income because they are expenditure. Hey, hire a very good corporate lawyer. So that's that's what you, you know can get any by chance. <laughs> you guys already found one out. Oh, um, oh snap! Oh. Uh, <laughs> so Maisie, I hope that answered the question. Like that's two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand. That's where it's like people think, oh, they're rich, but those people usually, and I'll be honest. There are several of you, guys, there are several of you in your in this community who are earning $200,000, $250,000, and you would say, no way my mom and dad are not earning that. That's what they earn, but then in terms of payroll and all the other insurances and liability things that they're doing, yeah, so is and other on student their loans and stuff that they're paying back, it's like their, their profit margin is in many ways an income of $60,000 with different... It's not $200,000 extra dollars. Correct. So it's that's where cash. you're going to see yeah. more than 50% of your income can be taxed so if you're above the 250000 insurance? I will the tell benefits? you they yes. are not, but in terms of investments, it's called capital gains tax. That's what Republicans like lose sleep over is because if you invest the government and if you earn profit on it, the government can also tax that. Mm-hmm. Now, this is the idea is then Keynes would say, but look what we can do to help big picture of the economy going, right? But what if the economy's so, already good, though? So, so guys, real, real quick, real quick. Maisie, I hope that answers the question. Yeah. $200,000, $250,000, that's the thing. Another point of contention, one of the wealthiest guys in the U.S., Bill Gates, he has a marginal tax rate of about 78% of his income. Oh, my God. What? But he's still got he millions and millions of dollars. And I love it that stuff he said that. We hear that number like, what? But it's like... It's all in stocks. But also, oh. like... It's more the principle of it, right? Because the reality is, it's like, oh my gosh, my half of my other Key Largo island is now gone. 
It's like I don't get it to drive my that Porsche doesn't anymore. really destroy <laughs> your world. But the principle rubs you the wrong way. But like they're okay. Like financially, there's okay. one guy that was um, not a freaking Lamborghini. I was reading about Kane's last night, and it's like that he like part of his like came up with this like. This is Sarah's light reading. Said, you know, just reading like, about Kane. One every dollar that is paid in taxes. I'm taking the quiz more, on more credit. Like, whatever it is, because the consumers, the producers wouldn't have spent that money anyway. But I feel like most of the time the producers do like spend that money. Right. So I feel like can't be should be used if the producers are like right all sitting all their money. And so, and that's, and there you go. That's the, the answer, I think, in general. we got to time these different policies correctly. Um, uh, because on a micro scale, local scale can hurt producers, right? But on a big scale, it's like, let's get this going, and that can help out a country. Um, so maybe there's that question answered, I hope, and Trey. So would Keynes economics, would it have been taking us out of the depression without the world war? Like, would it have worked? <laughs> Wait, what? Economists disagree on this, meaning they don't know. Uh, he was asking the question, so here's the thing. Would the U.S. have gotten out of the Great Depression only using Keynesian economics? What are your thoughts? I'm telling you, I don't. I really don't know. It was a huge contribu contributing factor. I, I would say, Spencer, maybe 50-50. I would say, based on what I learned, and I'm not an economist, right? 50-50. That fit, and that's where they disagree, right? But yeah. But I would say, maybe you could say 51-49, that 51% of it was the war. The, the mobilizing of forces and, and Rosie the Riveter, right? All these employees and customers and consumers. That probably did most of it. But Keynesian economics has been pointed to in terms of getting us out of different slumps, right? Um, so maybe a 51-49 split, that's for me. More on the war side. But I love that you bring it up because the war thing matters, the quote, our outgoing president, Bigley. It's huge. It's huge. Um, but great, great point, Trey. Like it's probably the war. And so, okay, sir, you're saying that Jeff feels are more more of the war to do with it. Yeah. yeah. Are you on medicine? No. Okay. Just making sure. I did not ask him to ask that. Don't. I, I, I don't want to. Oh, ask. he put me up to it actually. Paisley just looked right at like daggers at me. Like I did not say. Holy crap. Uh, yes, Sammy. So again, they many Democrats will say, look, forget the middle class. We're going to focus with Keynesian economics literally on those top 1%, right? Mm -hmm. so we're going to have them go from 78% to 79% of the marginal tax bracket, and that alone can bring in some good revenue, right? Yeah. There are some principal things that seem wrong with like milking that cow, so to speak, a lot, which seems on principle a little bit rough. But the middle class... Even a small increase in taxes for those small business owners can be a death sentence, right? We've already covered that. So you're asking, where is the middle class in this? Um, to be blunt, you'll see many Republican operatives who will say, our party actually cares about the upper middle class. Okay? You say, so we're talking about 200,000 or more. The Democrats will say our party actually cares about the working class. So maybe 50,000 years, 60,000 years. Technically, both of those groups are in the middle class. But the question is the party, which is the party that favors your group? Does that, does that make sense? So Democrats will say Keynesian economics, let's help out in terms of college tax credits. OK, here we go. And Republicans will say, let's focus on tax cuts in general and payroll tax. Because that's going to help the small business owners. Is that going to help those earning sixty, seventy thousand dollars a year? No. no. So does that answer your question? I mean, like that's what they will say. That's what the two parties will say. They're covering middle class. It's just they're covering different parts of it. And that's why when you're watching like ads and you're like, oh, wait, he said he cares about middle class, and he said he cares about middle class. They're caring about different ends of the spectrum. If that makes sense. Hunter, last thing. So the idea of like we're only going to tax the one percent or the four right, right, four hundred thousand dollar or more, yeah, yes, something like so that. So the idea behind that is they'll tax those guys and those guys well to make up for taxes. We're going to increase the leasing amount. We're going to increase this. So really, the idea is you're, you're affecting ninety nine percent while taxing the one percent because everyone else has to suffer. Correct. So, so the idea of Keynesian is like, can we minimize that burden on just them? Yeah. to help maximize some of the help there on the other. That's a good way to say it. 
But I also think, if, if that's what you're alluding to, right? Yeah, yeah. But I also think this is a perfect segue, ladies and gentlemen, for five more points. We see the pros of Keynesian economics, that maybe the consumers, the producers are being super stubborn, and we need to get that out there, cool. <coughs> what is the biggest con of Keynesian economics? If you leave it for too long, like it's not a Okay, if you leave it for too long, what's gonna happen? You're gonna be screwed. Then inflation <laughs> happens, and then yeah. people get disincentivized to move up. There you go. In other words, so you're going to be screwed. You're welcome. So, like Venezuela? <laughs> so, in, in a way, yes. Social welfare, but they, Correct. And, it was, and it worked the short term. Like, it worked really short well. Short term. Chavez they, was great for them. And then now it's the Maduro. And then Maduro, guys. and it's bad. <laughs> so, guys, I would, let's write down this one thing, and I'll get to you, Ellie. Guys, this is the second thing. The one problem with this, the one problem with this is if used for too long, people can get lazy, right? The one problem with this is if used for too long, people can get lazy. Oh, no. We'll do it. We'll do it. Oh. If used for too long. This is the first try I've been if people, uh, sorry, uh, the, the one problem with this is if user too long, people can get lazy. And we'll stop there. I want to get into this. Sarah and Sam, you guys were alluding to this, to de-incentivize it, right? Explain. Hint, hint on the test so, we might cover. This. So how does this, how could this make people lazy? How could? Like, so if you're just if you know that you have the government like giving you money kind of and you keep going along with it, why would you want to go like out and go do all the hard work that it requires to like get a good job and to try to move up past brackets to like maximize your growth when you don't actually have to do that work. Does that make sense? Like oh, yeah. if you're That's in the like least. lower if totally. you're in the lowest tax totally. bracket, like it's easier to just stay there and have the government feed you money and like you get by than it is right. to like go do the work and try to move up. It's right. to move up. The government stops providing you right. stuff. So people start. will like stop going to work for the past like the last month of like their trimester right. and quarter and like it so creates a culture, a subculture that I don't think anybody likes, right? Like there's a reality of because we want it on principle people to um, be working hard, right? Helping out the economy, doing their own individual civic duty. But if people are gaming the system and are thinking, wait, if I actually get into the workforce and I'm earning less than if I were to have part time but getting certain government benefits, and mind you, that's a subculture. Please don't get it twisted and think, that's right, if we tax the rich, period, we're going to have like nothing but vagabonds roaming the whole great country of the US. But in degrees, you could see it. It's a principle thing that if you keep it going too long, it could engender a culture of, of apathy. Of like, well, why do it when I could get it for free? Right? There is an idea. And some were saying, like, going back to communism, I think uh, Hunter was saying that ultimately that's one of communism's biggest downfall is ingenuity, having um, innovation. It dies if there isn't a money incentive for producers, which sounds so greedy. I mean, it sounds greedy as I'm saying it, right? Yeah. But ladies and gentlemen, a healthy economy isn't about how you feel. It's about getting products to consumers. Which again, sounds so materialistic. And Christmas is around the corner. Like, I mean, <laughs> that's, and that's where China, like other countries, communist countries who make fun of like our hyper-materialism, they have some legitimacy in saying that. Like, don't get lost in this. We're just talking about how to make a good capitalist economy that there is on principle. Okay, so I wanted to get to, Hell, you had your hand up. Yes, Ellie. So I just got a question. Um, yeah. So like, where our economy is at right now, what would you say, your opinion, what type of uh, economic structure would you say would yeah. probably be the best fitting to fix <coughs> our economy at the moment? Right, so like as you're talking about sort of that, the dip in the valley, like yeah. which one like should we be? Yeah, 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 so we're in a dip, we are, we are. Yeah. Even without COVID, we would have been projected to have some type of bubble bursting. Yeah. Look at housing market, ladies and gentlemen, right now. Like, people are building like crazy, but I'm like, okay, this, you guys are perfectly seeing a bubble. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for noticing that. You're like, wait a second, after this doesn't add up. People are losing jobs because of COVID, but yet more homes are being built. Because they're only like at 2.2% right now. Today they're t down to 2.2, not even a 2.9, a 2.2. So, so, so guys, that bubble, Ellie, 
even without COVID could have burst, right? But considering yeah. that we're, we're in the midst of a little weird recession, micro recession, and it very well could keep going. Now, recession could be a year. I, we've, I've seen that in my lifetime. It could be the Great Recession. That was for like four years. That really sucked. So you're asking, what would I predict of these two? Trump actually in the last year signed executive order and also approved the, the stimulus checks, right, in terms of um, from COVID. So that was actually a Keynesian model there. Um, Trump from that metric actually was a little bit more Keynesian than George W. Bush. George W. Bush was very much a supply side economics, Bush tax cuts, okay? So of those two, what would I think would work more effectively now? If we get a vaccine within the next four months that people use, if those two things happen, then probably the, you probably would, I think a supply side economics angle would work better to where employers, because I believe employers want to hire people right now. Like I think so, because they've been on a nice little growth pattern. I don't think tax cuts on them would be bad. I think that'd be more beneficial than just giving more stimulus checks. I do think this next round that'll happen probably once the new government sits in will be good. I think that's good, but then probably like a 60-40, 60% more supply side, yeah, yeah, yeah. and then 40% like here's a little bit of help, but like we're gonna really try to get payroll tax down so that companies will hire more people. That That's my yeah. opinion. All the companies completely lost money. Everyone's lost money, and so it's kind of like, yeah. who, who are we taking more money from? Yeah, like, yeah. So, no. so it's like a 60-40. I think after this last round, that's my take. Then I think the government should be like, okay, we need to like cut payroll taxes or give rebates. I don't care what you call it. Like if you're helping producers out a little bit more, that could help because they're ready to hire. Under the, like the Great Recession, people were not hiring. They were not hiring. So that's my answer for that. Talia. Um, okay, so like if COVID didn't exist right now, um, okay, this is kind of hard because I'm a big believer in like you get what you work for. Like, yeah, yeah, you get, yeah, you have the money from working your butt off and going to school, and like you should keep it. But at the same time, there are a lot of people that aren't able to get that education and like are stuck in poverty. Yes, yes, so like, I don't know, it's just like a hard concept. Like, I just like, of course, I think we should help people out by maybe, like, making the rich pay a few more taxes because they do have the money. But then again, does it, like, does it kind of degrade of them, like, working hard for it? To get it to can I, can, yeah. let's go on the back page because yeah. you, per and I will get to this, I promise, but on the back page, under civil society, Tali, you're segueing perfectly into Martin Luther King's definitions, okay? We're going to get into that because he had the same problem. He morally felt the same tension you're dealing with right now, right? You get what you deserve. Let's go. So then there's people like, right, from there's, where okay. you're from? Yeah. Right, right. So, so did I see abusive welfare? Yeah, I did. But did I see it actually used and help people have a, ideally you want a hand up, not a hand out. Yeah. Right? Um, and I'll be honest with you, I would have been able to go to college without generous help from the university for scholarships, which is a hand up. That's not welfare. I get it. So you're trying to target those things well. So Martin Luther King Jr., okay? There's gonna be a total of like four things we write down here under civil liberties versus civil rights. Um, but I want you to write down, the first thing is equality of opportunity versus equality of result. Equality of opportunity versus equality of result. This is Martin Luther King Jr.'s problems. And if I had you and your sister, we'd talk a little bit about it, right? Letter from Birmingham Jail, that was written like later. He, he believed at that time he was so tired and frustrated from all the inequalities, Tali, the rigged system that it feels for certain groups, subcultures, mm -hmm. that's hard for us to understand, but they feel like they're stuck in poverty, right? Mm -hmm. He was so tired of that systemic discrimination that he said, screw opportunity, just give the gold trophy medal to everybody because I'm just tired of that discrimination. Mm -hmm. That's equality result, right? Mm -hmm. What's equality of opportunity? Like giving everyone like a chance to go do it, but only like the best one to do it. Right. Like, everyone the, has a chance. And so it's everyone has a chance. And in theory, an equal opportunity for success. Like they're not rigging the game where like, we're going to have you run from the bleachers. Like that. 
that would be a rigged system, but where it's an equal opportunity for success. But that will never happen. That's impossible. But that's the hard it's thing. Like utopian style, like yeah. like right. That's if you have control. So, so equal opportunity and equal result. The I have a dream, you know, that speech was very much equality of opportunity, mm -hmm. right? That you judge a man by the content of their character and not the color of their skin. Powerful words. Some might say utopian words. But we're trying to get to that. If we can manage to where people have an equal chance, then you're feeling good. When those injustices are found and are not exaggerated. That's the tricky part for a government to say, we're going to help people out, or we're just going to make it be fair in general. And I know, honey, you're failing. I'm not looking at your eye, but <laughs> you're failing and this, you're screwed, but those are the consequences of your choices. Right? You're talking to that balance. I don't have the right answer because our country is so diverse, but way more diverse than sweet. It's, and like economics, it might require both styles, but man, it's hard to tell, like, when do we just got to like, give them the handout? Yeah. Or what it's got to be like. Like during about that time, it's only like $14 trillion or something. And, and the yeah. idea of reparations has always been around there, you know, like uh, how do we deal with that, right? I will tell you the answer that I have tried to grapple with, and it was from a law professor. He was like, look, and he, he talked about how he ran the law class. And then he said, I love him, Dr. Strickley. He was great. He was one of the classes I got like an A minus in. But like, I would take that A minus over any other A in other classes, okay? Because he said, I'm gonna hold the bar here, but I'm gonna lovingly hold the bar here. I'm gonna work and work like a mother to get you to hit that bar, or rather to go over the bar, if you will. But many of you won't get that bar. You won't, but that's on you, but I'm gonna work tirelessly to help you get it. I'm gonna lovingly hold that bar, and you might hate me for it, but I'm not going to move that bar. That balance is something that stuck with me. So on the issue of civil society, of you know, particularly with race relations, that's a good answer I have heard. How does that translate into policy? Because I've seen many people get out of poverty with great government programs. Yeah. And it, it's sad because some people don't even get a shot to hit that bar because it's not right. like their parents, they were born into it without even having a choice of like they can't even afford to. And using the professor as an example, he would stay after for hours after a lecture and seminar to help students that he saw were failing. He'd stay after. And, and I was like, dang, that's devotion. But he wouldn't give them the easier test. Yeah. If that makes, you know. Yeah. So they'd end up with a C, but that C is impressive for but them. He was trying, but it's still their own. Right, 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 right. Yeah, so that's like the angle of, and George W. Bush tried to come out with what's called compassionate conservatism. It doesn't work out, but but he tried to because Republicans are seen as being no, 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 right? So that that angle should be there too. Uh, Sammy, you had a, your hand up from before. Yeah, it was about the like lazy because like yeah, I guess another way to like get you know, and stuff like, to work is like why would I want to go to like fifteen years of medical school and be five hundred thousand dollars in debt and have to pay most of my money to the government and to not even get rewarded or even pay off the debt that I. I will tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, because I think you guys are ready and mature enough to hear this. When you look at the Constitution, which was created by mainly white, land-owning old men, some look at the Constitution and say it's a very dire and very like depressing document. But they looked at the human nature, Sam, and said, like, this is human nature. And if we can somehow maximize the best of human nature, encourage growth and innovation by having a carrot on the end of the stack be money, then we've got a good society. And you're not wrong to look at that case and be like, that seems so base and shallow. Like, why would we want a country driven by money, right? Shouldn't we do it out of the goodness of our heart? And that's where Stalin's like, duh. Like, he would say, yes, we should, but communism in theory. Yeah, he was once, such a great dad. He, yeah, <laughs> once, once everybody do it out of the goodness of their heart, right? But our founders, and also economically, Sammy, it's, it's uh, you got to incentivize people. You got so doctors. I understand. Well, I love to help patients. Yes, but there's also a monetary incentive, right? Teachers, honestly, are teachers. Not for money. <laughs> Not for money. Yeah, I think they're. Okay. But I would also say this, Tony. They're schooling. Teachers 
have a unique insulation for tenure, right? You guys have some, you guys have connections right here in the class. Unlike other private offices that you can have theory of being fired a lot, teachers are very insulated. And so that's because an attraction. Like really too, like, because we don't have other, like, there's not as much like competition. competition there isn't, yeah. Yeah, there isn't. Very good. Okay, the last, I'm trying to summarize here. So the last thing you're going to write down here under civil liberties and civil, right, civil rights and be the last notes we take in this class. But they said there are I know, I'm summarizing. So the second thing, right? Civil rights, and put in parentheses, Civil Rights, Civil Rights Act of 1964. and Voting Rights Act so Civil of 1965. So Civil Rights, parentheses, Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Voting Rights Act of 1965 and parentheses. What year? So Civil Rights Parentheses Civil Rights Act of 1964 and Voting Rights Act of 1965 and parentheses are different are different from civil liberties. So ladies and gentlemen for you to actually hit this target of 183, which the actual map differential I'm not going to figure out. But for you to actually hit that 183, got to go AP level. Someone describe for me the difference between civil rights. I'll give you an example here. Civil Rights Act 1964, Voting Rights Act 1965. How is that different from civil liberties? Which, in parentheses, you can put down Bill of Rights. Civil rights are different from civil liberties. Sarah? Civil rights are the rights that are guaranteed in the Constitution. Civil liberties are things that like protect like my and people. Oh, backwards, 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 backwards. The other way around. Okay, then they blew my mind that you okay, and then I'm, I said, just help me out, help me out. I want to give credit to your AP or your US history. Did you just get that online or what did you? That's fine. Did you just get it online? That's good, that's fine. I just I'm glad the source you looked up, that's exactly it, guys. Civil liberties, which is the oh, bill. Yeah, civil liberties are I know the Bill of Rights throws you off. You're like, oh, what? That should be called Bill of Liberties, right? The first ten amendments, guys. Shh, 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 this is crucial. Civil liberties are where the government says you got power and gear. I'm staying far away from it. You have the right to bear arms. You do your own thing. Freedom of assembly, freedom of press, freedom of religion. You do you, boo. I'm over here. I'm the government. Wait. Civil rights are. You are a minority, Brendan, and you have been discriminated against, so I'm going to come and help you by gunpoint make sure that you can vote good, sir. Voting Rights Act made sure that there were no poll tests at these stations. Civil liberties are open. Civil rights are in your business, okay? There's pros and cons of both. Guys, I have a conference tomorrow. I'm putting on, as I wrote it up here, a review on my YouTube channel, right? Like we've done in the past, in which you will go over those things, okay? I encourage you tonight, if you want to, or tomorrow in class, to like review it, right? On Thursday, we'll actually have the test. Is that, that right? Would you write something? We, we will. We'll have some more. And so, yes, from Sarah and Tyler's help in switching around, you guys got the incentive. So, I'm just going to. So is it 25, right? Yeah. Is that what we're looking at? Because we were 83 and then we were 75. All right, we'll, we'll keep, it, keep it honest here. Here's the... What? Thank you. 25, right? Is that what we're looking So is that okay? Okay, so you guys are Oh, thank you, good sir. Yes, yes, I'll update that. Is there any way you can pull up my grade really fast? Yeah, yeah, let's take a look. Let's take a look. Huh? Soft grade, that's not. I really don't have normal.